Okay, um, so the first question I will start with is one I cannot say a lot about, but um, it is very to the point. Uh, Hanka, what do you think of the health abilities of the human body? How long are we able to live in a healthy body? Um, and can the length of our life tell something about our spiritual health? Um, well, it's a very complex thing. Um, so, uh, there are a lot of stories of people living for 120 years, 200 years, even up to 400 years in different uh, religious writings. Um, so, as in recorded history, people don't get that old. Um, they barely make it over a hundred, most of them. Um, if we look at the, the, the causes of death, basically statistically, um, uh, there are diseases and there are organ failures, except for the, the violent deaths. Um, diseases are usually uh, the result of having a not so healthy uh, body, because it's more vulnerable to poisons, diseases, viruses. So ultimately to have a long life, uh, barring uh, injury, violence and other things, uh, the main thing to do is try to focus on keeping your organs, your body functioning in an optimal fashion. And your spiritual health is very, very related to the healthy function of the body. Um, every person um, has, has a constitution, so our body has a tendency um, uh, to be strong in some points and weak in other points. And uh, just like a chain, the body breaks at its weakest point. And everybody has a weakest point, uh, an organ or an energy which is at its most uh, sensitive or vulnerable. Um, by working consecutively on these weakest points and removing them as the weakest link from the chain, uh, slowly but surely the uh, quality of the link improves. Um, there's also, of course, the question of uh, hereditary health. Um, because, in a way, because of our development of medicine and our rather uh, odd system of uh, procreation, we don't really genetically select for uh, the healthiest combinations. And uh, given the amount of medicine we have developed, um, actually the genetical health of humans is going down, also because of pollutants, uh, uh, damage to our genes, uh, because of um, yeah, uh, free radicals, uh, radiation and other problems uh, decreasing our genetic base. Um, always in nature you see that there has to be a certain amount of predation, a certain amount of filtering of bad genes, uh, to take away the negative mutations which crop up just during time. Um, but on the spiritual perspective, um, what is generally uh, problematic is the, uh, when there is not enough uptake of, it, of energy, uh, a bad distribution uh, or a bad distribution of energy. Uh, the bad uptake is usually due to um, uh, poor development of the uh, of several chakras. So especially we have some chakras around the nose and we have uh, chakras in our mouth along the uh, esophagus, in the stomach, in our lungs, uh, the knees, the hands, um, the elbows, the feet, um, also the uh, delta chakra, heart chakra, um, also third chakra, these are all chakras which are very essential for connecting ourselves to our environment. Uh, so as I said before, you have chakras in your nose and two chakras per lung. They help us with absorbing energy from the air and from smell. Um, we have four chakras along the uh, digestive tract which help us to gain energy from our food. Um, the hand and the elbow chakras they help us to uh, absorb short-term energy, so we pick up energy which we release straight away. 
So this creates a kind of an energy flow so we can work without taxing the rest of our system, disturbing the rest of our organs. And there's the flow from the feet, uh, the ankles, the, um, and the knees, which is basically uh, there to support um, the life force which flows into the body from the earth. We also receive some um, um, guidance um, from higher powers uh, through our delta chakra, which is between our shoulder blades, um, and also uh, through our uh, crown chakra. Um, if these yeah, influences are not there, it is harder to harmonize the energies in the body. And if the heart chakra does not work well, it is hard to connect to other living beings. And also if the uh, third chakra does not function well, we cannot filter out negative energies from positive energies. So very quickly we will poison our energetic body. Um, all these chakras are also connected, of course, to our meridian system, where um, it's very important that we have very healthy wood meridians, um, which have a destructive capability so they can help to filter out negative energies and that we work very well um, with our water meridians which decide the pace so that we don't work too hard or too slow but we have a healthy pace of activity um, and the earth meridians which help us to open up to good energies and to shut, close off to negative energies so all these systems have to be our organs which help us to maintain a healthy energy body to maintain a healthy flow of energy coming into our being so the um, amount of circulation is uh, determined by our second chakra uh, because basically through our desires we make ourselves more active more uh, alive if you will um, so that's a little bit of the story of how to um, create the spiritual health when it comes to energies flowing in. Um, when it comes to the distribution, it is a little bit more tricky. So ultimately we want to have a healthy distribution of the energy between our chakras. So the energies in our chakra need to be pure, they need to, be able to flow well and connect well with the energies around us. Um, the second thing which is important is the health of our meridian system. Um, so our meridian system basically has a few um, um, switches, if you will. Um, so if we are processing information, then our meridian system will focus the energy to our upper chest and head because we need to be active, we need to be focused, we need to be thinking, we need to be able to defend ourselves. So this is basically a stress reaction. But all the life force will concentrate around the head and shoulders. Um, this usually also gives uh, headaches, uh, muscle tension in the neck and in the shoulders, because there's just too much energy there, too much activity. So uh, the second energy system is basically when we're not having to deal with yeah, um, a crisis in our surroundings, but we focus basically on digesting and rebalancing our body, dealing with what happened to us before. Um, so this is the integration of um, the lessons we learn, of the knowledge we gather. Um, and in this system, um, it's also uh, basically the life energy is focused on our torso. So basically the, the middle area. So the pelvic area and the shoulders are not included, but the middle area is. And this helps us to really purify, also to deal with traumas, with emotions. Um, and really to uh, attain a new healthy balance. Um, the third energy system is basically the charging system. Um, so basically the energy is stored in the, in the pelvic area and in the legs and this we use when we relax we don't have to process anything we can just relax just be uh, sleep sit in the sauna enjoy a massage something like that and um,
unfortunately what we see a lot in modern people is that most of the energy is in the head they don't have time to process and really balance themselves out and they have even less time really to relax or to slow down uh, fortunately the slowing down tends to happen while we sleep but the processing tends not to happen enough so a lot of people um, are stuck with emotions and convictions um, which are in a way unbalancing the, the flow of life force and uh, this hampers the functioning of the organs um, so for instance if a person has a very strong morality um, they don't want to hurt anybody they only want to be good um, this is an unbalance so their own destructive energy cannot go anywhere and it tends to then since the energy cannot flow outward it tends to flow inward and it tends to turn into cancer um, there are other um, things when a person has a very low um, very low self-esteem very little confidence very little faith a negative self-image uh, then the creative energy cannot flow out and uh, uh, then that energy tends to flow in into the head into fantasies into illusions into insanity uh, into mental instability uh, neural instability um, so there are a lot of uh, instances where basically an unbalanced energy body will eventually lead to an unbalanced physical body uh, the amount of time it takes for an unbalanced energy body to cause uh, also a physical defect uh, depends on the yeah, basically the constitution of the energy body and the constitution of the physical body. So it's very hard to say like thing A always causes effect B. It just increases the likelihood of. And there are a lot of factors which have to be weighed to come to, uh, to an yeah, eventual effect. Um, so I don't know if this helped anything, um, but at least it tells you a little bit of the of the mechanics involved in uh, the spiritual effect on health. Um, Okay, there's another health-related question here about a healer's ethics. Uh, we assume that a healer in the best case will heal, and in the worst case everything will remain as it is. Nevertheless, sometimes the best solution for the patient is to leave the physical plane. From experience, uh, my friend's father died after visiting a healer because uh, it was him whom my friend was incapable of letting go and was keeping him in this world at the expense of her own health. People do not always understand what is right and want to resist. Should a healer in the first line observe what seems right from the client's point of view or rather what is right and healthy from the point of view of greater balance? Well, the short answer to this question is the latter. Um, to view what is healthy from the view of a greater balance. But it is a very tricky thing um, because ultimately we exist in the physical plane, in the physical world uh, because of our imbalances, uh, because of our, in a way, spiritual sickness, because of our attachment, our desires, um, our need to manifest ourselves. Um, so in a way if we would have been completely spiritually healthy we would have no need to inhabit a human body uh, so there has to be something screwed up or unbalanced about our nature um, for us to incarnate in the first place and if we heal that from a spiritual perspective then in a way our incarnation becomes useless so we will grow sick and die so in a way healing spiritually does not always mean that you also heal a person physically um, and that's a bit of a tricky concept. Um, if we look at um, uh, basically the client's point of view, the client's point of view is generally um, because the client is identified with the ego. 
and the ego is basically constructed um, as basically um, a subsystem of the spirit. Um, having a body carries a, a lot of responsibilities, there are a lot of tasks involved, uh, the body has to be able to maintain itself, to protect itself, both socially and physically, and also on, uh, on the level of health. So usually the spirit basically says like, okay, I will give the task of taking care of my health to the ego. So if a person comes to you complaining that they want to be healed, it's usually the ego which is telling you that there is something wrong and it needs to be fixed. Uh, and it is not always the perception of the spirit that there is something wrong which needs to be fixed because the spirit is generally not very aware of the health of the body unless it is really interrupting uh, with the spirit, uh, spirit's ability to perform its own mission or to have its own adventures. Then also the spirit might get involved. But also still the ego is usually the main power which is involved in this. And that makes it rather tricky. Because the ego has very little idea of balance. Um, the ego learns a few strategies during life and if those strategies don't work, the person gets sick or gets into trouble and they don't know what to do anymore because the knowledge and wisdom and power of the ego is rather limited. Uh, but nevertheless, it tends to overshadow the consciousness. Um, so listening to the ego is by definition not really going to help the client because if the ego's solutions would work, the client would not be looking for a healer. Um, but as a healer you should look at what the ego has tried to do and why it is not working. And this will give you some information about um, what has already been tried and what are also the blind spots of the ego. So from the ego and the questions you can learn a little bit of um, where are the weaknesses of the person because often in the areas of weakness this is where the problems might arise. So, uh, once you've done that, you should try to restore the balance. And then again you get into your own problems, because if you are still in your own ego, you are just going to rely on your experience, what you read in books, um, what your teacher told you. And uh, this might work, this might not work. But ultimately you're in a way acting like a robot. Um, you're trying to solve an ego problem on an ego level. Uh, so you're, in a way, usually working only um, to remove the, uh, the symptoms. So if a person is in pain and you have learned some tricks to take away the pain, you take away the pain, the person is happy. And you don't, do not remove the root cause, so the person will come back two weeks later because the pain has returned. So this provides an excellent return business, but it's not really helping the person to make a step forward in their life. It's rather the opposite. The person gets stuck in the same place because you're in a way facilitating them in getting stuck in the same place. So one example from my own practice, I had a client who came every two weeks because he had a lot of tension in his muscles, a lot of muscle pains, and he needed massages. So I massaged him a, a bit and when he came back two weeks later for the second massage I said like gosh this is odd you have the same stress the same problems so what is going on in your life and he told me like he has a lot of boardroom meetings and a lot of political fighting within the company and um, so I told him like okay well try to work with it differently and so he came back a third time and then I said like, listen, I'm not here to help you to stay in this position. I'm here to help you to move on, to stop your suffering, to take, to take different steps. But yeah, if you're not willing to do this, then I'm not here just for you to, to stay in your same place. I'm not going to keep on facilitating that. So when he came back the fourth time and things were still the same, he was not making any changes in his life. I basically told him bye bye, you're not going to be welcome here anymore until you've changed your job or started working with it differently or um, found another strategy to um, yeah, 
to move on in life because now you're just getting stuck, unbalanced and you're in a way using me not to grow, not to make any changes. So that's very important for a healer to do, to keep that integrity and instead of keep the money. Um, it is the most essential thing for a healer is not to have a lot of skill or to have a lot of power but rather to have a lot of harmony um, because if you have a sense of harmony you can feel what is wrong with your client you can feel what the client needs and you can intuitively bring your attention to that spot to that location to uh, talk about that aspect of the client's life so the client will be able to make a change so basically then everything you do will be beneficial it will help the client even you might do very little or you might do it inexpertly uh, or clumsily still the attention and the energy is going to the right place so having a good sense of harmony uh, in a way make sure that your intervention is positive a good a large amount of energy and a large amount of skill all they produce is speed so instead of taking 10 or 20 sessions for a person to, to heal, if the person has a lot of strength as well as skill, then maybe the person will be done in four sessions. But the essential effect is determined by your sense of harmony, not by your amount of power or your amount of skill. Um, the amount of skill is important to reduce side effects. Um, so if I apply a lot of force, a lot of power to the client, um, then the energy body of the client will be affected, well, proportionately to uh, both my power and to the receptiveness of the client. So also the faith, the bond, the relationship between you and the client, the amount of love, the amount of trust is also very essential because otherwise your force, your strength will just go to waste. Um, so, assuming there is a very good connection, there is faith, there is trust, there is love between you and the client, and there is an amount of strength pouring into the client, uh, then the amount of skill determines how effectively this energy will work on the client. Um, if the, there is too much change, then the uh, person's energy body will go into confusion and will, in a way, reset itself to previous state it will in a way restore the backup so the healing energy and a lot of the things you've taught and done will also be rejected uh, another option if too much energy is applied is that a fuse will blow uh, energetically so the person will uh, uh, also let uh, an amount of energy flow flow out or some damage may be done to the energy body by the energy going in. Um, so it's very important to use your skill to really pace uh, the energy and also to feel how much energy is enough for the client because the client needs to in a way digest the change, digest the information you've given them and uh, this requires work, it requires time, um, it requires e own energy of the client not just implanted energy. Um, so also using skill you need less power of your own to get effects because if you just use your skill you can move the energy energies within the client's body um, you can channel energies or invite energies to work on the client um, you can also uh, just redistribute the energy in the client's body so I would say in yeah, order of importance, first is harmony, second skill, third is power. Um, and that's very important to note also if you're looking um, for a healer. Uh, one, are they harmonious? Two, are they skilled? Three, are they powerful? Um, so don't be blinded by power because it can have a lot of disruptive effects if there is not enough harmony and the person is acting out of their ego or out of their ignorance 
and um, the same is also a little bit true if you want to start um, healing through machines or other mechanical means. Um, because the machine has power, it is possible if the machine is applied in a correct way that it has a certain skill, uh, but the machine does not have harmony. So it's always very important if you do this to either really um, have a, a client who is enough attuned to harmony to know what is the right dosage, when is enough is enough, or to have that intuition when using the machine or also the medication. Because if you're uh, giving either uh, regular or energetic medication, um, it's also very much necessary to develop skill and feeling for harmony uh, to yeah, work in the best interest of your client. Um, so uh, indeed sometimes the best solution is to leave the physical plane um, and to need also to often look at the, at the situation. Uh, the, your client is not just an island um, of health or consciousness often the health of the client is very much related to the family, family members, work situation, the place where they live. Um, so if possible I always try to tune in or to visit the place where they live uh, and tune in and visit the place where they work um, and also to see the family members they're connected to. Um, because ultimately health is a holistic thing and healing should also be a holistic thing. Okay, um, I'll pause here for a moment to see if there are any questions uh, about the uh, health before moving on to another topic. Okay, then I'll move on to the next topic. So I got here a series of uh, three questions. Um, they're concerned um, with the transition from uh, um, a living to, uh, to death. So the first question on this topic of life to death um, is in many religions it is said that after death the soul will remain in connection with its earthly life for several days. During this time the deceased can make its presence known by turning on or off lights, wind, feelings of cold, nightly caressing, etc. In the uh, Indian tradition it is said that after 13 days the soul departs for the astral. What is the cor correct period and how to know this? Um, so first of all it is correct that indeed the, uh, there is a period when uh, the consciousness is still connected to its earthly life and also to the life force which is departing the physical body after death. So at the moment of death there is still a lot of energy and emotions and other things which are still present in the body, also knowledge. And these things can be absorbed, they in a way evaporate out of the body and um, usually for the first couple of days after death, the first two or three days, um, the, the physical body is releasing these energies. And in this period also the physical body tends to attract a lot of spirits which try to feed off these energies. And this can be rather um, distressing for the person who just died. Uh, because to them they are still connected to these energies, they feel like their energy body and they have a very nasty experience of being in a way being eaten alive, being ripped to shreds by all these other spirits who are gnawing and tearing at their energy body. So it's almost like being eaten again even though like it's normal for a, a person or an animal when they die they are eaten by some animals, but also then they're also eaten in the energetic sense, which is actually worse. 
Um, so it is very good in a way to try to protect or to preserve uh, the, the, phys the, the energy body after the person has died. So um, after death it is very good to either protect the, the physical body by uh, holding a wake, uh, putting it in a sacred place, uh, putting a metal fence around it uh, to stabilize uh, um, the energies which are there and to keep out yeah, hostile spirits which want to feed on it. Um, if the physical body is not um, accessible or cannot be protected in this way, it is very good to yeah, call for protective spirits, um, guardian spirits, uh, death angels, so uh, that the transition can be done in a calm way, in a peaceful manner. Um, the person has to get unused to, to, to the physical body. Um, and actually in the period after death, the spirit, because they're very, they have a lot of energy on the physical plane, and they are also very uh, skillful in driving or using a physical body, it is possible for the spirit of the deceased to possess another human. Um, so often the person has a very strong desire to keep on living and this person out of the you know, desire to, to, to stay or fear to move on they can become very troublesome for the living. Uh, so they can try to possess a person but they can also start stealing life force. Um, Usually when uh, a person's life force is being robbed or drained, it is by another human. There are very few cases in which a nature spirit who is very, very angry might also um, do that to humans uh, to protect an area usually. Um, it is usually, such a spirit is usually a guardian of a holy place, holy to nature spirits and it will try to protect uh, its sacred place by, um, by doing this. Um, so the turning on and off of lights, wind, nightly caressing and other uh, sensations uh, in a way affecting the physical world and also affecting physical bodies, uh, they can be done while uh, this energy is still available to the spirit. So depending on the quality of the transition process, so ideally if the person was able to take all the energy which was remaining in their physical body along, especially if also the life force or energy in the body was very strong at the moment of death. So when the person is very young in life, uh, then the spirit will have a lot of energy available and can create stronger effects than um, uh, when yeah, the energy body is weaker or it has been longer after death because these heavier energies, they tend to evaporate and the spirit of the person who has died cannot hold on to them and will eventually, by the disintegration of the, uh, of the energy body, be forced to go into the astral. Um, such a spirit can be called back into the physical by making sacrifices, by making life force again available uh, so that the spirit can act on the physical plane. Um, so in some cases uh, spirit is called back from the astral in such a way, but in other cases a spirit actually never leaves uh, for the astral by the continual sacrifices, which can be part of a tribal tradition or some other religious tradition. So some tribes or in certain religions uh, spirit is in a way revered as a godlike person and given the power to continue to work as a protector also on the physical level, or as a healer also on the physical level. So for instance, if a very good uh, fighter or a very good healer dies, um, within a certain religion they may be accorded a position, so and through the sacrifices their energy body, their knowledge, their skill will remain intact, and they keep can keep on functioning as a healer or protector. But these are rather special cases. It is usual that people simply move on. Um, in general, I advise my students 
to uh, wait for a period of three months before um, working with the spirit of a deceased directly. And I do this because indeed there is a danger of possession or the stealing of energies. Usually after a period of three months, if nothing strange is happening, so the person is not stealing life force from somewhere, or um, then after in three months you can be pretty sure that the, the, the spirit has no more uh, link, direct link to the physical world uh, in such a degree that it can really affect objects or the living in a very strong way. Um, one of the exceptions if, is if a spirit links itself to a place um, because it will then build up power, energy uh, in, the, in its home and uh, by building it up it in a way creates an energy body which it can use but the energy body is highly localized so it can only do something in one specific room or in one specific house but not outside of it. So it is in a way um, using the physical world as a surrogate energy body uh, for its own energy body. But this takes quite some time to, uh, to do so. And also these energy bodies deplete rather quickly. So if there is a case of a haunting, um, often like after a few weeks or months if they find out the chasing away of the living is not working, they will run out of energy and they will probably move to another place where they can be undisturbed. Um, so often also spirits by nature look for places which where there's very little disturbance to the energy body. Uh, deserted places like the attic or the cellar are usually favorites, storerooms, and places where there's a lot of activity um, bathrooms, kitchens, uh, especially there are the worst places for a spirit to try to haunt. Um, so it is usually um, safest I find, um, if you do not want to disturb a spirit, to ask another spirit how that spirit is doing. So if I, as a living person, make contact with the spirit, I in a way reconnect it to its previous life or to the physical world. If I were to ask one of my guides, who is already in the spirit world, to contact it, it is not reconnected with the physical life and the disturbance to its yeah, uh, progress is a lot less. So this is really the ideal way to, to work with the spirit of the deceased. You first ask one of your own spirits, like in what state is the deceased person, is it safe, are they ready to contact the living um, and if so then you can make a direct contact but I would never start by with initiating direct contact with, uh, with the dead person. So is it allowed to contact the deceased while the spirit is still connected to its previous life? Um, yes it is allowed and sometimes it is even good or beneficial. Um, often the, the, the period after death is a very confusing period for the person who, uh, who was living. And um, they often want to do something, say something or receive guidance or blessings. Um, give advice to the people they're leaving and um, often if this can be done it can ease the passing of a spirit so it can take away all the frustrations and it can give them the feeling that their life was well used and they can in a way wrap things up so they can move on also to the next incarnation more easily so providing guidance for people who are dying or for people who have died recently is actually a very good thing to do but, as I said before, it also has risks, it can be dangerous if the deceased is in a very confused state or in a very aggressive state. So, although it's very worthwhile to do, it can be dangerous. Um, 
Is it easier for both us and the spirit during this time to have contact? Um, yes, it is generally easier. Uh, there's less distance to travel for both the spirit nor, uh, and for you. Um, but for the spirit it can have a complication of by in a way reconnecting to its uh, uh, yeah, to the things which it is trying to forget um, that it will be harder for it to move on and there is a risk that if a spirit engages in a lot of contact with the living uh, it will become a wandering spirit it will in, instead of like losing its identification with the physical world and gaining its identification with its spirit which can reincarnate there is a risk that its identification with the physical world will remain strong or become stronger and that its identification with its spirit will not develop so if i give the the person a role again so usually when the person has died they feel useless they feel like okay i cannot do anything anymore it's no use for me to stay here and they will move on but if I give the person a job like okay protect the house uh, look after my children uh, advise me heal me um, uh, then the person will feel useful again they will feel like okay I've got something to do uh, so I should stay here I should try to stay here until my task is done um, so in a way you're binding them again um, to their uh, to the earth usually the person is bound in the process of incarnation this is usually a voluntary bound, bound binding because people incarnate because of the, their desire to do something or to experience something and um, after their life is gone they have to release that binding and rebind themselves if they wish to reincarnate again and often the binding which occurs in this per period in between it is not a binding which is created by the spirit uh, it is a binding which is created by fear uh, of moving on or it is created by the ego which is still identified with the life so it is not very good to uh, give tasks or positions to uh, a person's spirit while it is still in this intermediate state Um, so will the deceased be disrupted by such requests for contact or would it be better to wait a while um, in general waiting uh, is better only initiate contact or make contact if you are pretty confident that it will be beneficial for the spirit in long term um, this can be upsetting or problematic for family members who of course want to know that their loved one is okay um, but it is generally better in a way to let the loved ones um, suffer for a while and um, allow the spirit the time to move on and then after the spirit has moved on after a few months you can get into contact with the deceased and focus back uh, on the on the loved ones on the family members and tell them that now the spirit has moved on or it is safe or they can help it by performing certain things but i generally wait for a few months and don't go immediately into the yeah, grief or other problems which are also ego problems uh, because the spirit knows the other spirit exists and they still have contact but on the ego level on the identified level with the body there is of course a lot of pain and disruption and yeah drama sadness frustration going on uh, but it is not good to let the ego problems um, weigh more heavily than the uh, needs and the desires of the spirit so always keep this in mind if the spirit also wants to have contact uh, or to work through some things then do it if it is only the ego then don't do it So what is the best time to contact the spirit before or after its journey to the astral? Well, I kind of answered that. Uh, it's a very individual thing. So sometimes it is necessary to contact before or sometimes it's better to contact after. Um, in general, I find it's a lot easier to talk with the spirit after it has moved on into the astral. 
Uh, before that, usually the spirit is quite emotional um, and also still caught up in its beliefs and its illusions which it had during its life. So it will often not listen or not be open for guidance or even a decent conversation um, while this is still going on because they are still in the process of having to let go of what they are really attached to, which they have built up during all their lives. Um, so it's usually not very productive to speak to a spirit quickly after its death. It's more productive to speak to a spirit after it has moved in, on into the astral. But it depends very much upon the, why you would make contact to the spirit. So the next question is about the experience of moving on. Um, the question is, is there any truth to there being a tunnel of light? And um, the life flashing before your eyes. Um, yes, there is truth to it, but it is not so spiritual. Um, the tunnel of light is basically um, an effect of the brain dying, uh, being deprived of oxygen. Um, so basically if you start losing consciousness, if you start being choked, uh, this is a very common illusion, a very common thing the brain generates. Um, because basically the uh, all the light basically tends to uh, shrink to one point. Um, it's, it's in a way the most simple sensation the visual cortex can produce. It's a point of light. Um, so it is not really a tunnel, but it may be perceived as such um, or interpreted as such. And it is not bad to interpret it in such a way. I think it's a very helpful interpretation because it helps you to focus on the higher worlds, but ultimately the yeah, source is not energetic the source is physical of this uh, sensation. Um, the life flashing before your eyes, um, it is a dual sensation. Because basically one of the things which happens in the dying brain is that in an attempt to keep on functioning, it removes all filters. So in a way all the patterns in your brain are activating at the same time. So all thoughts, all memories, all things are um, in a way uh, activating and in a way you're scrolling backwards. So the first things you're aware of are the things which are already activated, so things in your recent past. And basically as the brain starts dying, the more complex the connections die off first. And the oldest, the most primitive connections remain. And these are basically your earliest memories, your childhood in uh, memories. So you are scrolling backwards in time but this is basically a process of association uh, which is intrinsic to to our brain structure and the dying brain. Um, but a similar thing also happens to the spirit but on a much slower pace. So in a way as the energies start leaving the body uh, the spirit has to decide whether to connect to them or not, whether to hold on to them and try to incorporate them into the spirit which is trying to move on or not. So it is the life flashing by is basically both a spiritual aspect and a physical aspect. But the spiritual aspect is much longer, it can take several days as I said before. Um, also the process of um, uh, cremation or otherwise destruction or transformation of the energy body can be problematic because it hastens this process. You have to incorporate the energies straight away at the moment of burning. You don't have a few days time to really allow to yourself to absorb them gradually. Um, also if you are eaten, uh, part of your energy body is absorbed by the, the being which is eating you on a physical level. So if I'm eating by a bear, part of my knowledge and experience and life force will pass into the bear. The other part, which the bear is not interested in, I can still uh, digest myself or use myself. As the body is degrading inside the bear, the energy is released out of the bear and comes back into 
the care of the, uh, the, the spirit whose body it used to be. Um, so this is also a way um, in which an animal can help you uh, by dying and giving its energy body to you. It can pass on part of its knowledge, its skill, its life force, its experiences to the person who's eating it. But, well, it has to be willing. It can also fight you, so in a way turn its energy rather negative or focus on its hate, on its pain, on its anger and this will also affect the, the person who's eating it. So it's best to eat something which is willing to give its life, uh, which has had a very happy life, which has a very harmonious energy, rather than in a way killing it with a lot of stress and brutal struggle and force. So clean kills are best. Painless deaths are also uh, good for us. Uh, if we eat meat. Um, so, what is the effect of contacting the astral on the spirit? Um, the effect is actually a dual effect. So, the, uh, the, the consciousness will experience a light, not immediately after death, usually immediately after death, the first thing which they will notice is that they can still see the physical world only after a, a lot of their heavier energies are dissolving then they will see their guides, other spirits um, other spirits of dead people and only after a while, after they've been there for a while they will start opening up to, uh, to the astral world if a person has a lot of high energy or contact with an egregore or spirit group or god or goddess um, they may go into the astral more quickly because they feel in a way that this part of their energy body which is already on this higher vibration will pull them upwards into the astral and in this astral we get into a very interesting phase um, because there are various types of light in the astral. And the first light experienced is usually the false light, also called the Luciferical light, which is different from the true light. So the false light is descri described quite adequately um, also in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, because it is basically the light of desires, the light of attachment. And as long as we have any desire or any attachment, we will tend to, to go into that part of the astral, the illusionary astral, which will cycle us back into an incarnation, uh, still attached to our illusions, to our sins, to our problems. Um, and the less we attach to this uh, luciferical light, and the more we attach to this pure light, um, the less junk we will take into our next incarnation. So the degree of yeah, uh, the spherical light compared to pure light really determines the quality of our incarnations. Um, so it's very possible also if there is only the spherical light that we take lower incarnations. We go back in, in consciousness, we go into more simple beings we might turn into an ant again or something like that. Um, while if we have a lot of true light we might actually incarnate into a higher form uh, to become a servant of a deity, to become uh, um, uh, a guiding uh, uh, a spirit guide or something of that order. Or uh, yeah, some other protective or guiding spirit rather than having to be uh, reincarnated again into a physical body. Um, it is very uh, tempting to, to the person to grab any guidance, any stability um, which they can find. And usually they will uh, go for the luciferical light because it is closest to what they just left. It is closest to yeah, the life they, they left. And if they have no sense of adventure, no curiosity for new things, they tend to take a very low incarnation again. Also if they have very low instincts, um, 
a lot of anger, a lot of desires, they also tend to go very strongly into this luciferical light and go back into a rather primitive incarnation. Uh, but if on the opposite they have uh, worked on their spiritual development, increased their contact with the higher cosmos, um, of either egregores, spirit groups, um, um, divine beings, angels, um, yeah, they tend to fare better and to go into a higher states of consciousness before choosing or having to incarnate again. And they will bring this higher level of consciousness with them. So they will bring less um, junk, more skill, uh, more calm, more harmony into their lives. Uh, so it's very important to prepare for death. Uh, it's a very good investment, if you will, <laughs> uh, into your next life. Um, so I've already answered the next question a bit. How does the spirit determine its destination in the afterlife and what are the stages of this journey? So the destination is basically determined by the type of light, um, which is usually a mix between luciferical light because we are impure beings, we are misguided beings, uh, we have attachment when we have desires, and the pure light, which, uh, which are also attachments, but at least higher attachments, higher emotions, higher feelings. And uh, this mix, um, which we um, have at the moment of birth, is transformed through our lives. So actually, we can go down or up in our lives. Uh, if during a lifetime we spend a lot of time improving our spirit, our spirit will have a beneficial effect from that life and will get a better incarnation. If during that life we've become more deluded, more attached, more twisted, built up a heavier karma, then we will yeah, um, get a worse incarnation. Ultimately, by building up experience through different lives, um, we build up more skill, more experience, and we start having better incarnations. But yeah, it's better to learn uh, the skillful way than the hard way. Uh, it's better to use some discipline and focus in improving your life than just yeah, uh, try your luck and try out things haphazardly and make some progress in that way. So you're talking about roughly a factor of a hundred up to ten thousand um, in how much progress you will make from being like utterly ignorant um, and just being a, an idiot uh, focusing on, on low temporary desires to being completely focused on very high powers very high desires so the amount of speed the amount of progression you can make in a life is uh, yeah, has a very, very different factor of, um, of progress. So, the right focus, right goals in your life can make a huge difference in, uh, in speed. Uh, so, the stages of the journey I went through already a little bit. Um, so, I won't go into that again. So the last point of this question, does one join one spirit group immediately or does one rec recover from their life first? Um, usually if a person is very connected to an egregore or to a spirit group, uh, you actually go into a hospital. Um, so the spirit group or the egregore usually has a place of healing for people who yeah, are just coming out of their incarnation. So you can reintegrate all the powers and experiences you had from the previous life and either you keep them yourself or you give them to the egregore and the egregore will get rid of them if they're too heavy or non-useful. Um, so often these experiences of going to an astral resting place or an astral bed, um, they often are indications that you are connected to a spirit group or an egregore which has such a house of healing. Um, if you are not connected or you have not 
uh, you've lost your way or disrupted the connection, uh, then it is a lot tougher. There is not really um, a place for you to do this safely. You just have to survive in the astral jungle while uh, dealing with uh, the remnants of your previous life. Okay, um, those were the questions I wanted to answer today. Is everything clear or are there more questions or remarks? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, a previous uh, subject was uh, to see the light when you're dying, the dying brain. Um, I once heard uh, that uh, people who are taking ibogaine therapy uh, to uh, get rid of the addiction of heroin uh, they also see the light. It's uh, like a similar uh, experience. It's almost like a near death experience, except they feel like they um, get to be the person before they were uh, addicted. So, um, d did you hear anything about that? Uh, yes, I'll just repeat the question. Um, um, so, it there are therapies, um, for instance, to get rid of uh, addictions, um, in which people also experience this light and experience their original being. Um, so there are uh, basically um, two types of experience which, uh, which can give also such a uh, going back to your original self or going back into the, the light, the light of creation. Um, it can be done by stimulation and it can be done by um, uh, basically um, hallucinogenic drugs. Um, it is possible by uh, stimulating the energy body by in a way taking in more and more energy that um, the, uh, the higher parts of the self become so stimulated that they become dominant and that um, ultimately the, uh, the consciousness transfers from the ego into the spirit again. Uh, so this is often a combination of, um, of meditation and concentration as well as energetical exercises. Uh, there are also certain drugs and um, uh, certain other substances or a group of healers or a group of people who can help you to get such an experience by feeding you the energy into your body. Also if you do a solar ritual you can use the solar energy also to channel the solar impulse into your energy body also to get such an experience of um, in a way becoming again your, uh, your spirit. Uh, it is a little bit dangerous because you might blow a fuse and um, you might go insane and there might also be damage to the energy body, but it is a technique and it can also be done more controlled, but it takes a lot of practice. Um, actually to do this um, uh, with a lot of practice, part of it are the, the, the tantric techniques and the bardo techniques. Um, in uh, Buddhism, especially the tantric techniques, they help you to really yeah, focus the energy on the higher parts of the energy body to get such an experience. Um, also by using uh, certain types of hallucinogenics, especially if you take hallucinogenic, which is also a stimulant, then the energy body gets into a higher vibration, it gets nurtured, it gets fed, and also the, uh, the hallucinogenic uh, removes a lot of the blockages, a lot of the filters, um, which the ego uses in a way to block out the, the influence or the consciousness of the spirit. Um, what is often the result of such an experience is that the person uh, becomes more harmonized. Um, in a way what the, the, spirit, the incarnating spirit does, it translates its desires, its consciousness into, um, into instructions. And these instructions have to be absorbed and built into the ego. And this is a process which does not always work perfectly. 
So the perfect ego is just a reflection of the spirit and it should have all the desires and goals and of the spirit. But in reality, because the ego has to deal with the outside world, it tends to get polluted, it tends to get twisted uh, a little bit. And by again putting in the dominance of the spirit, um, you can see how your ego is malformed, how your ego is damaged, and you can work on repairing it. And uh, you can also try to maintain the dominance of the spirit over the ego, so that the twisted ego, while it is still twisted, yeah, does not harm you on your life path. And when the ego is yeah, repaired again, it can take over again. Um, so that's a very nice question. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, well, <laughs> um, the, uh, you said something about uh, that there are also beings made uh, not from the fallen cosmos, but um, I don't remember the word now. Um, without connection to anything high. Do you understand what I mean? Um, yes. Um, well, a deformation of the souls. Um, when you duplicate a soul and uh, mm -hmm. when, the, when it's something um, very uh, low energy, um, uh, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I'm also a bit sick. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, when, when those souls, uh, without any connection at all, like, I don't know what the name is, when they are... Uh, what happens to them? Do they always stay on Earth or...? Yes, um, I will repeat the question. So, uh, what happens uh, uh, to a person when their soul, their essence, is actually has been created in ignorance in the fallen cosmos? Are they forever trapped? Um, they're not forever trapped, because basically through their experience in life they can make contact um, with other beings who have a memory of the, the, the unfallen universe. And they can even meet powers or energies which are from this unfallen universe. So slowly but surely, through incarnations and experience, even such a spirit which is born in, in complete darkness, in complete ignorance, can slowly build up um, some knowledge or some, some models of what the unfallen cosmos could be like and start to move towards it. Um, also that the, the spirit was created in ignorance does not mean that by necessity it has a, a consciousness which is linked to the material plane. Um, such a spirit can be a very high spirit, it can uh, uh, be basically equal to for instance, many gods and goddesses, they are created in the, in the fallen cosmos. Sometimes they are created in coordination uh, uh, with, uh, with the unfallen universe, but there are also dark gods who are in a way created without the knowledge of the, un, uh, of the, the pure universe, of the divine universe. And such a being has a very high state of consciousness, a lot of power, a lot of skill, a lot of wisdom. Um, and can also manifest a lot of incarnations and also reincarnations. Um, so that is not a, a blockage for incarnation or reincarnation, but it is a blockage uh, only into the uh, connecting to this uh, divine impulse. And so these spirits w which are born in ignorance, they tend to um, not to be able to focus really on their spiritual development, spiritual growth very well. So they tend to be lost pretty much in this in this universe because they have no internal guidance um, to help them to, to, yeah, to, to grow towards being a better spirit, a higher spirit, which can eventually leave this cosmos. Okay, any more questions? Only one, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, uh, how many of those souls are here on Earth? If you say like percentage, is it a really relative few? Yes, uh, there, there are quite few. So 
um, ultimately if you if you look at the the percentage of beings which are created in uh, in darkness or in ignorance um, if you look at the, the Arimanic cosmos it is it is the largest percentage about one fifth twenty percent of the uh, of the souls in the Arimanic cosmos are created in ignorance um, if you look at the uh, basically the, the Luciferical cosmos yeah, it is less than uh, than 10 percent and in the uh, uh, satanic cosmos it is probably around three percent um, but also these spirits who are yeah in a way created in ignorance they're usually very simple spirits very much servant spirits so often they're unable to take physical incarnation um, so if you're talking about physically incarnated beings I think it's maybe one in ten thousand uh, of, of incarnated beings which might have uh, uh, a spirit which is which is still in ignorance it's quite rare to happen but also in the energetic worlds you encounter them more often so they're an exception rather than a, than a rule but they're very uh, problematic in nature these beings okay no more questions okay well thank you and I'll uh, 